Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast, where we are rediscovering the ancient way. Thank you for tuning in today over at pathtozion.com or right here on YouTube. Find us on Facebook as well, of course. We want to thank um, any new followers that we are picking up because of the recent Shiloh Ben Hod interview that we did a few days ago over in Knoxville. It just posted, I think, yesterday. Um, if you don't know who he is or his music, you can go check out that video, won't you? There's some links there. You can see some of uh, the videos that he does and some listen to some of the music um, that he records from Israel as uh, a Messianic worship artist. Um, we really enjoyed meeting them and getting to talk to them a little bit about the music, of course, and as well of, of uh, just kind of the present condition of the church that he sees from his vantage point in Israel. Um now listen, today is going to be a couple parts, and, and I'm kind of, I'm really stirred this morning um, when I'm recording this towards a topic that, that basically came to light through a conversation with a brother yesterday. I couldn't tell you exactly how we landed there, but we just started talking about what I have called for this series, the power of the present, the power of the present. Now, now, just to give a little bit of a, a oversight, I guess, a, a summary of an introduction of what this is going to be, and my hope is, is to talk about how a lot of times, even as believers, as regenerated Christ men who walk the best we can, sometimes and sometimes not our best, to try to be sanctified imagers of the Most High, as, as I talk about in many programs, um, walking in the image and the likeness of the Son, who, of course, was the invisible, the image of the invisible. Yeshua said many times, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that should be true for us as well. And if that is in fact true, then many of the attributes that, that we see in, in the God-man, in, in the Emmanuel reality of Yeshua Messiah, those, those attributes should look like our attributes, our the way we carry ourselves, the way we talk, the way we perceive things that come to pass in our lives and our perspective towards them, it should, in incrementally increasing measure, look like the S-O-N, <laughs> look like the sun. The, the Hooper Grimoche, you can go back and watch that video series about what? The, the stylus of the teacher carving out a way to go, a way to walk, the hoopergramos reality of this is the way to walk. We were given that demonstration in the sun. And that's what I really want to drive home today about the power of the present is, scripturally speaking, how do we walk in, because of course we I never did this, but of course, years ago, the bracelets of what would Jesus do? And of course, it's no new topic within the, the body of Messiah, the church, to talk about how Jesus functioned. What did he do? Why did he look so different? Why did he look so dramatically different from you and I? Many times, if we're honest, situations I'm in, um, how I respond to something, my perspective, the words out of my mouth, don't often, sadly to say, too often, don't look like how Yeshua talked, how he responded, how he functioned in, in a certain circumstance. And so we're going to talk about today, now I want to, I'm going to talk about some scriptural direction that we've been given on how we can harness the power of the present. Now, just to be clear, I don't want this to be some catchy phrase and my name is Joel, but don't confuse me with another Joel who's going to try to manipulate the scripture to, to give you a best life now reality and you can harness the power of the present moment if you just walk in the spirit. And This is no hokey, um, you know, three-step program to how to walk in the power of the present. That is not this whatsoever, just to be clear. But what we are going to talk about to begin with is in Greek, there is a word called kairos that refers to time. There's basically two 
words that personify time in the New Testament, specifically in Greek. One is kairos, the other is chronos. Now, we're going to stick to kairos because the best way, from my understanding, to really describe kairos most appropriately refers to quality as opposed to quantity. Um, Okay, so we're talking about the power of the present. This word in the scripture that shows up a lot, this kairos, is, a, is, is about quality. It's not about measuring time um, on a timeline. It's more importantly, it's about the, the, quanti- the, the quality rather of time. It speaks of a now reality. It can also be understood as an opportune time for action. Okay? And so a seizing of the moment, if you will. Because moments come and go, and we all know whether we're, we're halfway through our life or maybe on the other latter half, <laughs> or we're young. Whatever the case, our lives' moments are so fleeting. The Bible always talks about our life being what? A vapor, a breath. It's just here and whew, it's gone. Um, and that is so true. And I know as we get older... We realize that more and more, and of course that's the pattern of humanity, you begin to want to harness the power of the present more, I believe, as we mature because we see the brevity of life and we begin to understand, scripturally speaking, like, oh man, that's true. (laughs) That's true. My life is just a breath and it's just flying by. And so this, this Kairos understanding in the scripture, we see Yeshua, of course, being the model individual of the Kairos reality, the Kairos understanding. Um, He was one who walked in the power of the present, this Kairos Kairos reality, at all times. Because why? He was was fully God and fully man, and, and he only did what the Father was doing, and he only spoke what the Father was speaking, and so he was always in this perfect communion because of he didn't go through the, the, the boundary and the dome of, of, of sin and shame and rebellion. And so he had this clear, ongoing dialogue with the Father and the ability to see differently than at most times we see. I'm not saying it's unattainable. It's not, or else this would throw the whole thing out. There's no point in talking about this. But in, the, in most cases, we are naturally-minded people who are bound through what we see, what we experience, what we feel, and and what we assess in the present moment. And and I I would and everyone's different towards this, but I am a a uh, assessor. I, I am constantly my mind is just made this way. Every circumstance I'm in, I'm I'm gauging the room, the individuals, the circumstances. I'm going through what I think is about to happen, what he means when he says that and and who's going to possibly speak next and what they might say and what I'm going to respond with. I'm an assessor uh, constant um, of my surroundings and my circumstances, the individuals and, and different intricacies therein. It's, it's something that I have, I still have to constantly take those thoughts captive and submit them to the Messiah to help me to scale back and, and, and kind of do this with my Kairos reality. Now, Yeshua, of course, I can constantly look to him because he was this example of how to rightly carry oneself dependent upon the Father to move about all the circumstances and all of those little intricate details therein to allow it to what? To become the will of the Father carried out through the Son. And that's the invitation to you and I today for those of us who actually are regenerated Christ man, born again, born from above, and now no longer living unto our own purposes and wills. The invitation is for us all. Now in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, Yeshua says this, Which one, being troubled with cares and seeking to promote your own interests, can add one hour to the span of your life? Another version may say, can add one cubit. And so what we're talking about is is no man has the ability to add to his life. It is a predetermined, predestined 
fact that Yahweh Elohim, as he created and, and, and breathed life into the lungs of every human being that ever was, is, and will be, he already knows, and it's within the palm of his awesome, perfect hand, and I cannot add even one hour or one little tiny amount of space to it. And so with that understanding, Yeshua goes on to talk about later in Matthew chapter 6, and of course in the Gospels and other places as well, he goes on to say to not worry about tomorrow. Now we could just keep it down here and have this Sunday school-esque, don't you worry, don't be anxious, stop that. And that's kind of where a lot of the church hovers is, a, a self-help program on how not to be anxious anymore and how to stop worrying, stop being fearful. Don't do that anymore, John. Well, I believe there's more for us to talk about than just stop that type teaching. And so we're going to look at these things and these principles that continue that Yeshua taught. Now, why did Yeshua talk about that? Why would he have said that? The Old Testament now speaks of Yahweh's what? His daily provision. We saw that with his people and the, the provision of the manna. They were, of course, hungry and needed food, needed literal life and sustenance in the natural. And he gave that to them. And in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, we're told that the people are to go out that day and gather enough for that day. Now, presumably, you know enough about the spiritual understanding of manna. And, and yes, it was natural food. Yes, it was a natural provision, of course. And then we have all of the spiritual imagery therein that's buried within the principle of the manna about where every single need that you have as, as, as Yahweh Elohim's people will be given to you when you need it. It will be brought to you however he wills, when necessary. And you can trust in that, friend. You can trust in that as much now as those people that were, were in slavery or in the desert or in whatever circumstances the original people of Yahweh were in. Their needs would absolutely always be provided for. And, and only, problems only came for them then and for us now problems came for them problems come for us now when we begin to panic and question i'm not sure everything i need is going to be provided for by my heavenly father and when we get on that ground friends we're on shaky ground any one of us whether mature immature or anywhere in between there spiritually speaking when we begin to have a little moment internalized that's this little panic anxiety-driven moment of maybe it's just a matter of I don't know how this is going to go. And that's where we're going to head next. And I, I believe the Father led me to something that is very interesting that I've not really heard tied into the be anxious for nothing, um, trust in the Lord, and all these things that we talk about is kind of catchy Christianese phrases and Bible verses, of course, is their start, but they kind of become taglines and slogans merely topical and not really practically powerful but we're going to talk about this some stay tuned for that because I'm going to I'm going to shine some light on something that maybe has not been extracted from the scriptures and applied to this specifically but the people are told in Exodus 16 to go out for that day and gather all that you need and guess what the father will continue to provide in his timing what a kairos reality now, again, we're talking Old Testament, but there's no great division like we've been told. It's just a different word. I didn't even take the time to go into the time understanding of the Old Testament because this would have become more than I feel like it needs to be today. But continuing this principle that we see with the manna, Yeshua tells people who are listening to him in Matthew chapter 6 to pray something. He tells them certain things to pray, and one of the things that he says is give us this day our daily bread. Now, the people who were hearing that would have made a quicker connection than you and I uh, to this understanding of what he's saying. He's, he's reiterating what happened in Exodus with the people of God and their daily provision. Go gather what you need. It will be sufficient. Don't worry. Don't wonder. Don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. No matter where you are and what you're experiencing and what your need's going to be, don't worry about all that. It's coming in due time. 
You go gather what you need, go about your business. Live out your day sustained, provided for, fed, and satisfied, okay? Now let's look briefly back and we're going to begin to insert what I think is something that maybe is not directly, um, it's not the first go-to place in the Bible to what I have found this morning in my studies and just reading um, for a couple hours and writing out these notes for this program today is something I want to challenge you to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And I want you to put on your thinking caps and just ask the Father and read it for yourself and and think of all the spiritual principles that you know and Bible verses and stack them one on another on another and ask yourself what I'm going to propose. Could it be true? So I want to briefly look all the way back to the Garden of Eden and submit something that maybe you have not thought of before towards how we wrestle and strain with what we could just very simply describe as a dissatisfaction with the present moment. Whether it's our identity, our spiritual condition, um, and we could play out into just practical things, our marriage, our children, our job, our, our, our ministry function that we've been given as, as people and members within the body of Messiah, this could go on forever. What is our current level of satisfaction with, with, with the kairos condition of our lives, this present moment reality? Okay, And so I want to go back to the Garden of Eden submit an idea, a, a thought towards this. I would say that this issue... Of, of what I just mentioned, being dissatisfied with our present, with, with missing the power of the present, which is what Yeshua was often talking to his followers and his closest disciples about. And anyone who would listen, in a, in a lot of ways, a lot of what he could be describing was, was summarized by, you're missing the present moment, friend. You're, you're overlooking what's right here. And that's what I want to go back to the Garden of Eden to present as a possibility of the origination of this issue with mankind, even the followers of Messiah, you perhaps, and me. I would say that looking back and looking ahead and being dissatisfied with our present moment circumstances began in the Garden. In the Garden, where sin and depravity as mankind rebelled, that this problem the seed of this issue, began. Here, at the very outset of mankind, depending on what you believe and and the age of the earth and the the eons of time and what is going on at creation and why why is the earth formless and void and what about this and that, all those things taken and put over over here in their proper place. In the garden with, with Adam and Eve, in their rebellion... I would say that at the very outset of mankind, we see that Eve was tempted to take her eyes off of what she had already been given, of, 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 of what she, not even what she had been given and provided for her in this garden reality, but more importantly, her literal identity. I would say that, that buried, one component that's buried within the temptation that, that, Hasatan, Lucifer, the devil, <laughs> what, what he presented to Adam and Eve, complex as it was, one thing within it was a dissatisfaction with their current condition, with their creation condition. They did not understand the power of the present of their created condition. They were beautiful they were the apple of the eye of the Creator. They were in the likeness and, of, and image of Yahweh Elohim and the they, counsel of Yahweh, who said, now, all these things, we won't get into that. Let's create them in our image. Perfect, flawless, sinless. No need to be clothed. They were already covered by Yahweh himself. He walked intimately with them in the garden, in the cool of the day. We talked about this in a recent teaching, talking about how in the, with the hiding and the shame and, and all these things that took place and how Yahweh came and had to clothe them and, and cover them, which wasn't even necessary before. And why? 
because they were already perfect. They were already the perfect design of the Creator. Flawless. And the enemy comes in, inserts the idea that, guess what? You're lacking something. There's something that in this present moment is not good. As you were told you are, Yahweh told us in Genesis, this is good, this is good, this is good. And we know scripturally speaking, it's not just good as we know it. <laughs> this is a good sandwich. It is, it is the best it can be, and it is set to perpetually create and recreate for the rest of time. And guess what, y'all? Mankind originally was just like that. So at the outset of mankind, though, Eve is presented something, an idea, that says what? There's something greater for you. There's something better for you than your present condition. There's something that's on the other side of something that he presented, the temptation, the, the eating, the partaking in the forbidden thing of Yahweh, the forbidden item. Something better and greater than what she had already been given, and again, to make clear who she already was. So the enemy offered something, and he tempted, he tempted Eve with what? That she could become something, looking past the present moment reality, overlooking the power of her present moment condition, which was perfect communion with the Creator. He caused her to look forward. He caused her to take her eyes off of the now and look forward. Huh. Forget, could we say, forget this now moment that's just so, we look at it and we're hard and we're critical. How could they ever? Friend, we do the same thing. It just looks a little different for us. You could be greater. And she took her eyes off of the now, the power of the present moment, this kairos reality, this, this opportune time of perfection that she and, the, and Adam were placed within, she looked forward for something better, something that would exalt her, make them better, which was a lie, of course. We know that. It was a deception. But just the same, it was what? It was pleasing. It was appealing. It was desirable for her to what? To her eyes. Friends, this is all about our gaze. This is all about our gaze. Once we take our eyes off of this Kairos reality, which is right here, right now, Yahweh Elohim is enough for me. And who I am in Him is enough. Whether I'm wrestling with a sin issue or whether I'm, I'm struggling in my spiritual maturation, whether I'm reading enough or praying enough, I'm not talking about all of that. I'm talking about my present moment condition as a regenerated Christ man. It is enough, and I'm going to be fascinated and continually focused upon the, the face of my Father because He's enough. He's enough. What about this tomorrow? He's enough. What about this that you did last year? No, He's enough. You see my eyes? What about, what about that mistake you made five years ago that's cost you all the way up? No, He's enough. What about next year? What if your business fails? What about this? Oh, no. No, he's enough. Friend, do you hear what I'm saying? It was pleasing to the eyes. What? To look and to get her eyes off of. The opportune time for action, which was right here, right now, right then and there. This is enough. I've been given enough. My daily bread, I've been given enough for today already in him. It is sufficient for me, okay? But she believed the lie that something greater was for her in the future. Something better than Adam and Eve's present moment reality in the garden at that time was for them. If they would only reach out and break the covenantal law of the Creator. By a seemingly harmless act, and that's, going, that's how it always comes. It's how it came and how it will always come to any one of us. 
Doesn't seem like much. Just, just, it's just one little thing. He's keeping something from you. They, of course, heard, listened, which are two different things, and responded longing for what was offered, which was what? You can be satisfied. It was a, it was a, a revelation, if you will, their eyes being open to the, to the not enough and the, where the enough is instead of what was already enough and sufficient in the hand of the Creator. And it cost them that intimacy, right? We don't have time to go into all that, but it cost them the intimacy of walking in perfect communion with Him. Why? The gaze went from locked on the Creator to I'm not enough, I wasn't created enough, I can take the wheel and I can harness by my own actions becoming better, becoming greater, changing my circumstances for my good. This is not enough. And friends, that's the lie that's extended to you today, friend. That's what's extended to me today, here and now, as I wrestle through my own life, as we bring today to a conclusion. And we'll have multiple parts coming, to be clear. The power of the present, friend, there is sufficiency for the people of Yahweh Elohim. And if you're not in him, you need to know we're not talking about an invitation of Jesus into your heart. We're talking about a heart exchange that is spoken of in Ezekiel so that there can be a house sufficient to hold, to become the abode of Yahweh. If, in fact, that has taken place in your life, friend, there is enough for you. There's enough for you. Forget your lack in a proper sense. It should compel us to continue to grow, to press ourselves, to become more disciplined, more responsible. Yes, of course. We can mature and be pushed by our lack. Yes. But when it becomes a crippling, um, smothering issue in our lives, we have to remember there's power in the present where everything that I need is right here, right now in Yeshua Messiah and His Holy Spirit that is in me, wanting and desiring to operate and fill me to full, to what? Give me the unction to keep the will of the Father and keep my gaze locked on Him. I'm not looking back. I'm not worried about the future. My gaze is set. And friends, that's what came in the garden. Now we're going to talk about that for, for a little bit more in the next part, and then we're going to move on to some more um, texts and uh, examples of what Yeshua did. To personify this, we're going to read some verses, some, some little snippets of, of New Testament activities and records for us to glean from to make this principle rock solid in us. And so we're talking about the power of the present. This is the Path to Zion podcast. You can find us at pathtozion.com 24-7, YouTube channel. Subscribe if you want to. Share these videos if it encourages you. It might encourage someone else. That's the only reason we do any of this stuff. And so thank you for watching today. We'll be back for part two of The Power of the Present right after this. Amen.